I am Eric Zimmerman. I'm a game designer and a faculty at the NYU Game Center. And uh, welcome back for our, are we ready to go? Yes. We're ready to go? Okay. Just make sure. Uh, welcome back to our annual event, Strategy Guide Breaking into the Game Industry. Before we start, I want to thank our event sponsors, local amazing game companies that support the Game Center and help make events like this and all of our free event series possible. That is Avalanche, Play Dots, Take Two, Gigantic Mechanic, and Fresh Planet in no particular order. Let's give it up for these companies. here tonight. So here's what's going to happen tonight. There's sort of two parts. The first part is this panel discussion. So we have a we have an amazing lineup of both veterans and recent graduates from the Game Center that are here to, to dialogue with me and each other and get answer questions from you guys about breaking the game industry. The second part of this evening is uh, um, a number of companies are here from the local in, from the local game industry um, and they will have tables or, or representatives here and many of them are, are looking for interns or, or staff, and so that's an opportunity for you to maybe put to use some of the knowledge that, uh, that we talk about in the first half. Um, I also want to let you know, there, the, in, a, in addition to companies with sort of formal tables, there are some developers that are here who are going to come up and say, hey, I'm from this company, we're, we're hiring or looking for this. If you are here right now from a game development company, and you know your company is looking for staff, you also uh, can get up at the end and sort of uh, show yourself if you're hiring, not if you're looking for a job, because that's probably both of you guys. So, so, um, so I'll remind you again, but uh, you might want to think about that. But we also have some, some, uh, 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 some other uh, uh, invited companies that are here. So before I bring up the panel, uh, I just want to say one thing, um, and that is, you know, I'm, I've taught here for a number of years. I've been in the game industry as a working designer for about 20 years, and people that are trying to break in, there's always this sense that it's like, ah, I'm a student, or I'm a newbie, or I'm just starting out, and I'm, I'm trying to figure it out, and it, th there's always this sense of like, well, there's this, just must be this one thing that I don't know, like the, the one website where I need to go to get all the listings of the juicy jobs, or the, the one way to prepare my resume, or the, the, one, the one company or contact that I need, or the one approach that I, that I can take, and the, the, the hard answer is that that doesn't exist. There is no silver bullet, right? It's hard work. And it, it, there is no like magic website you go to and suddenly you, you know, you sort of float into the game industry with a perfect job. Uh, it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of work to, to kind of sustain and grow your career over time. But it's, it can be done and it's, it's, a, it's a great industry and tonight we're here to, to kind of share knowledge with you about how that can happen and how you can get started specifically with an ear towards breaking into the game industry. So. Um, so I just, you know, I just want to dispel that myth, but, um, but, I, but I think that, that our, our amazing panelists will have a lot to say about this. Let's bring them up right now. Uh, let's give a round of applause. Come on up. Uh, uh, you can sit, sit in any order. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> mix it up, mix it up a little bit. So, um, so uh, I'll, I'll start on my far left. So Howard is here from, from Muse Games in Brooklyn. Uh, we have, like I said, a mix of both game industry veterans, people that have started companies or are responsible for hiring a lot of people, but we also have a couple recent graduates from the Game Center so that you guys can get both perspectives. Howard is here from Muse Games, uh, a local game developer. Grant is a recent graduate of our undergraduate program. And how, when did you graduate? 2012. 2012, and you've worked in? Yeah, I worked at uh, Arcadium for about three years and doing just game design on uh, mobile games as well as Facebook games and a lot of other kind of things as well. Outdoor games, a lot of, uh, I don't know, <laughs> all and, over. Uh, okay, great, so you've done, you've done work, but you're actually at your freelance independent yep. at the moment. And Howard, how would you describe Muse Games? Uh, we're just uh, in the studio, all, we're all in the room, one room. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we, mostly for PCs, we've done uh, one uh, mobile port, but mostly for PCs and it's going to PS4, which would be a challenge. <laughs> Great. So, uh, so you you're a multi-project kind of medium size, uh, small to medium size local game company. Yeah, we're still about ten. Okay, uh, maybe that's more on the smaller side. Uh, Mar and Margaret, you're working at uh, Play Dots. That's right. So that's a. Um, Mobile game company, free to play mobile games. Uh, and before that, I ran a, a small studio, uh, smaller than 10 people, people studio, <laughs> um, called Hide and Seek, which did a bunch of very experimental 
uh, stuff in the real world and on digital platforms for all kinds of strange partners. Okay. Um, one thing is, can everybody in the back hear them? Not, a, not at all? No. Okay, should we go to the mic? Can you guys speak a lot up or do you want to go sure. to a mic solution? We'll try and speak up. We only have one mic, unfortunately. So can you, We'll speak up. When we forget, yell. Yeah. Like, don't yeah. wait, yell. All right. Because otherwise, or it'll be Just raise your hand and or uh, do this kind of gesture for more more volume. All right. So, so Margaret, you work you work in a number of different contexts right. um, for games, and and Mattia, uh, you are one of the co-founders of uh, of uh, Gigantic Mechanic. Yeah. And uh, also one of the co-founders of the Come Out and Play Festival. Right. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of the of both of those with uh, with Retrofy uh, and. Uh, the kind of mechanic, what, what we do there is that we're uh, primarily focused on real world games, finding ways to uh, bring games, to pop, try to pop games out of their uh, traditional confines and bring them into the real world in various ways. Uh, and so that entails doing things that range from web games, uh, dealing with sort of documentary films and, uh, and, and, and real world situations, to uh, large scale museum installations and sort of everything in between. And we are tiny, there's a few of us. All right, um, and Tony, you are uh, another recent graduate. So you just when did you finish the MFA program? How many years ago was that? Point seven five. And so, uh, Tony, you're one of the co-founders of Secret Crush, yeah. and you guys have just released your first title on iOS, right? Yeah, it's called Sunburn. It's on sale now. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we actually have um, for, with you and you and Grant, we have. Um, both an indie developer trying to start start her own company with a couple of collaborators and Grant who's taken a more traditional route working working for other studios. Um, so to prepare these guys for the talk this evening, um, I asked all of them two questions. Um, the first one was, what are the myths that 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 you have or you feel that others have about breaking into the game industry? People that don't don't really know how it works and maybe have misconceptions because often we can we can learn from. What the, why those myths are around or, or why they're not true. And the second thing that I wanted to ask them was, when you're hiring someone, either to work for you or, or a coworker, having input on, on hiring in your company, who are, what are you looking for in a candidate? Um, and I found uh, in doing these, in doing these um, sessions that these two questions really elicit useful answers. So we're gonna go pretty, pretty rapidly through this. There's gonna be time for Q&A. Uh, with you guys at the end, but if, if you really have a burning question that relates to what we're talking about, feel free to raise your hand and and uh, and you can jump into the discussion with a question. All right, so let's start with myths. Um, so uh, the the first thing I want to talk about are myths myths about the game industry. So uh, so these were these were some of the ones that, that you guys came up with. Mattia, ah. you 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 <laughs> said that the industry is all AAA titles. So what what you want to talk about that for a second? Yeah. So when when I went. When I started in the game industry, I had this impression. Prior to starting in the game industry, I had this impression that the the, the game industry was pretty was, was very monolithic. It primarily made the kinds of things that I played in these sort of box games that I would purchase, and uh, and I didn't have a sense of how varied it was. And when I got into the game industry, I realized that there's many there's you know hundreds of different uh, s small niches inside of it, different ways in which we can participate, in the, uh, and there are a lot of opportunities for game design, lots of places that you wouldn't expect. And I would have never imagined doing the kind of work that I do now, uh, going into it uh, beforehand. So that, so don't despair, right, if you yeah. think that you need some kind of really hardcore AAA development skills. There's lots right. of ways to exist in the game industry. Right, there's lots of ways to exist in the game industry, and also you may find that once you get in the game industry, there, there may be lots of things that you may enjoy more than what you originally thought that you would. There may be things that attract you that, that, that you might find more more engaging than, than you originally thought. Um, Howard, you, you had the comment that you feel like the game industry is not as insular as people think it is. Yeah, I mean, I had an internship at Columbia, and I kind of felt like when, when I was there, uh, Can you guys hear Howard? Okay. No? Okay. So, I mean, I had an internship at, at Konami, and I, when I was there, I definitely felt like people were there, they have even more of a triple A mentality, and thought that, well, if I wanted, if, it, if someone wants to be hired at Konami, uh, they need to be have, like, extensive triple A experience, or, or experience at a bigger studio, and I think now, looking back, I just find that to be basically kind of true, or totally untrue. It's just because I think a lot of skills that people end up bringing, I mean, there's always the, the, the technical skills, whether somebody can code or not, um, or somebody can draw or not. But then there's also a lot of skills, such as, okay, how to manage a project, um, or you know how to manage a community, how to interact with players. Um, there are a lot of things like that that are really universal, um, that don't really apply to 
a specific industry. So I think, I, I definitely wouldn't say that just because oh, someone doesn't have a lot of ex experience in the game industry that, oh, the, industry, the, the game industry is. Oh, so you're saying that skills really transfer across, yeah, I think so. a, across from other things. Yeah. Um, Tony, you had the you had the third one on the screen that that you you felt like oh now that I'm indie I can just do whatever I want and <laughs> yeah. play games. So what do you what do you I mean what's the myth? What are you discovering now okay. that you're okay? You you can sort of do whatever you want, but not really because <laughs> <laughs> you get to do whatever you want when you're a student. So do be doing that now. Like take advantage of it. Um, it's but, the last. <laughs> what is it, guys? <laughs> um, it just is. When you're, so we just started a company uh, and we can, I guess, do whatever we want, but at the same time, we don't have funding to do things. So you sort of have to figure out where you're gonna get money for things and uh, sort of plan out. You have to plan things a lot ahead of time. You don't get the syllabus that guides you through <laughs> things. So uh, so you, you do have some flexibility, but it also, there are a lot of things to think about and so maybe the freedom that I expected is not necessarily there. But I think the bigger issue is that, I mean, whether or not you sort of knew that was gonna happen, as an indie, you are always, um, uh, uh, you have to find means of income, right? So yeah. for every, you don't sort of release a game and automatically are able to suddenly live off of the right. income, which may or may not come from that. So yeah. I don't know, you, you know, uh, Margaret and Mattia, you guys both ran independent studios, so that I guess you you both have done a you have to do a mix of client based work, right, and, and original work. How do you manage that? Uh, those yeah, and, and I think I've done nearly all of the configurations now. So I've done games where my funding was coming from advertising agencies or sneaker companies or government departments or health insurers or opera houses or you name it. Um, and I, I now work for a company that, that is funded, so we have a war chest and you think that's going to put you in a position where you can do whatever you want. I've made bootstrap things that we funded ourselves where I'm in Tony's position where you have nobody to answer to. Each of those situations also presents you with a set of responsibilities and requirements that you have to fit into. Um, and if you want to survive, you need to be smart and strategic about doing that. So I've... You know, I've, I've, I've been doing this, like, you know, for a good number of years now. I love all the things I've got to work on. Very few of those have been the dream configuration of my dream project. They've been tactical decisions that says, well, this is a thing I really want to do, but we have to do it in, and this happened, this, these are true numbers, we have to do it within six weeks and we've got a production budget of $20,000. What can this idea be in that structure? And the answer is a slightly weird thing that probably should have been different, but you, you're <laughs> constantly responding to those things. And now that I'm in a bigger company, you know, we, we, we have all kinds of luxuries in terms of time that I didn't have as a small studio where you're running six projects at once and dealing with a bunch of different people. But the, the market imperative is powerful and, and we have a very specific job to do. People have invested in us because of potential that they're eager to see us realize. So, we better get busy realizing it. It's a different so, kind of pressure. Yeah, it's a different so I think one of the reasons why it's really important to talk about the myths is that when you're interviewing for a job, you don't you don't want to have these misconceptions. You don't want to seem like the person who sort of has all of these idealized ideas about what the game industry is like. You want to have some sense of what it's really you don't for example, you don't want to show up in an interview and say, Yeah, I'd love to work for you. I have all these great ideas that you know I'll, I'll, I would love to share with you and you're gonna make a million dollars from my ideas. Well, you know, <laughs> game companies are full of super creative people and it's very rare that you sort of get to just do an original idea like that and turn it into a game. Yeah, I think along the same lines of the, the first one though, is that you also don't have to, I think a, a big myth that I struggled with, is that you don't have to make video games to mm -hmm. get in, right? Uh, so, kind of like what you were talking about a little. Yeah, a little uh, to Howard's point. Yeah, it's you don't have to just make video games. I struggled tons and tons of time uh, trying to learn how to code, how to make my own like little projects, and none of them were really what I liked, and they didn't show off my design skills all that well. Um, I had much, much more success actually creating all these different types of board games and all these outdoor games uh, as a student actually. Um, and then finding ways to promote those through all sorts of different means. Um, but it, it really helped uh, allow me to just cut the tech out and just actually focus on designing, right? Iterating and, and, and that kind of thing. 
Um, and then yeah. on top of that, yeah, right, ahead, right? Yeah, it, it's it's like a matter of then presenting that in an interview and overcoming it, <laughs> saying like, no, it's okay. Like I might not make video games, I might not have a portfolio of video games, but let me tell you about my design process in them. Um, and that really helps you overcome that kind of boundary. Well, I, I, I and thank you for segueing to our next set of myths <laughs> about breaking the biz because you're just sort of saying it here. You don't have to be a coder. I think it was Tony that mentioned that. So. A lot of people think that's the only kind of uh, job that right. that are that are in the game industry. Um, I think that uh, we're going to get to the skills that you do need. That's a uh, that's later on in the in the discussion tonight. But I think that that's that's an important uh, talk. You know, something that you but but Grant something that that you mentioned is that you said you had your board games. You had your um, I mean, can you be a game designer? This is, I think maybe Margaret put this down, that it's like, it's a myth that like, it's sort of like saying, oh, I'm gonna be the director. I, I wanna go in the film industry, I'll be a director. Let me start as a, there's no junior director. You have to kind of work your way up to that leadership role. What, what do you guys feel? Can you be a game designer? Is that, is that unrealistic expectation for starting out? I mean, certainly when I, when I added that note in, I recruited for a bunch of positions for producers and artists and biz dev people and um, programmers and event managers and writers and all kinds of things. I've never hired a game designer ever. Um, Why not? Because because you're nearly always working for companies, even in companies that you started yourself, that are founded by people who are game designers or who believe themselves to be game mm. designers or who hope <laughs> one day <laughs> to be considered game designers. Um, and there's never been a, a skills vacuum there. Now that's not true. I've worked as a game designer in a bunch of non-traditional settings. So I've been the person that a TV company hires because they don't know about games and they need someone who, who does. But I just, you know, when I was thinking about the, the questions that you were putting to us, you know, it struck me um, how rarely I've had a chance to post that job, how rarely I've seen somebody, particularly at a junior level, just have that identity um, it's not how I got started, um, and I think it still presents a real challenge. So, it's it's a it's an it's a wonderful ambition. Uh, pretty much everybody sitting in front of you right now is somebody who makes their living doing game design work. So it's definitely viable, but it's not a it's not a straightforward path. It's not a question of walking into the junior level game design job to get to the mid level game designer job to be creative director at the end of that process. You're not in your head, Howard. Yeah, I mean, generally, I'll say yes, but then. I think it also depends on the, the size of the team. I mean, sorry, like, I, we were a small team, of course, small indie team. I think anybody on the team really need to be ready to take on different roles. Um, so I think, yes, print in principle, yes, someone could be a game designer. Like, our on our team, our game designer primarily focused on game design, but he also does marketing and community management and so on and so forth. Um, so, so I think I don't, at least especially for a smaller indie team, I don't think the person will be just doing game design. But then again, nobody is. Just to clarify, because there may be people in the audience that want to get into the game industry. When we say game designer, that means it's not programming and it's not visual design and it's not project management. Often, sometimes there's overlap, but it's not managing the, the organizing the process or being a producer. It's someone that's more kind of an experienced designer, writing the rules of the game. It may be level design or, or uh, depending on the, the kind of game that you're making, it may be writing, it may be managing playtesting, often the game, those kind of game design jobs lead into that. Uh, writing a lot of documentation yeah. uh, for games and, um, and planning out the player experience. And, Go and, ahead. And funny enough, a lot of times you aren't actually making the mechanics themselves. Um, you're kind of making features that kind of support the mechanic, yeah. right? Uh, so a lot of times, when I was doing game design work, I'd be actually figuring out what is the best way to get a certain social feature in, right? What is the best way to get an economy to work well within this this game? And that's not necessarily anything to do with this like the mechanics of it or the rules of the, how you play the certain game. It might just be a lot of these other auxiliary features. Um, and that's just, I mean, you're not really working on the game maybe. Uh, so it's interesting. Yeah, no, it, yeah, I mean, absolutely. That's definitely true. Also, that, I, I would say that you can be a game designer, but often your what people's perception of what a game designer does is is wrong. You can't be a game designer in the sense of you you, you can be the idea guy. Like I show up here, I'm going to have some ideas for for, for mechanics, and uh, and people will build them. That that is definitely never going to happen. Uh, well, we I mean, 
we often, because we do relatively little digital work, or our work has less digital, uh, less of a digital component, we iterate a lot more on paper, and so therefore we have more of a demand for, for game designers. Uh, and we've, we've looked for them in the past. It's just very, very hard to find ones that have the, the, the experience. One of the, the, the problems that game, to be a game designer, what it requires is a lot of, is not necessarily ideas, but is the ability to be able to manage that process of, of the, of of the, of the sort of vision holder, as it's called sometimes, but that, and that that process is is hard and requires a certain set of experience and ability to work with people, the, the ability to understand that it's not necessarily your ideas that have to go in there, but it's, it's about managing all the ideas that come up from the team, figuring out which ones fit, which ones don't, keeping ideas on track. Like what are, this is probably the, for me one of the biggest bits that I see is this idea that people have that it's a being a game designer is about having ideas. Ideas are dirt cheap, and you have tons of them. And the problem, one of the biggest jobs of the designer is getting rid of ideas and saying that that's an awesome idea that's that's not fulfilling the needs of the project right now or what needs to happen right now uh, you we need to focus on what is the core mechanic and how what, what ideas are are getting us closer to what, what's fun and what ideas are getting further along lots of ideas are actually kind of bad often in, in, in design meetings so let's let okay okay downers who <laughs> don't, don't, don't become a game designer on the other hand margaret said that there was a myth which is that there aren't any jobs right. so if this is a myth that means there are that means that there are jobs, right? <laughs> so, so, uh, so, 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 so this, I think, is, the, is, <laughs> is, one, is one of the big pulling back the curtain moments. That having been on the job hunting side of the process, you know, you're, you're scrabbling, looking for opportunities, you're prepping for interviews, they're super intimidating, you're desperate to, you know, to make the best of this opportunity. What you don't see is the, is the recruitment meetings that that company is having where they're tearing their hair out going, okay, where, how are we gonna do this? Where are we gonna post this job listing? This time, how much money are we gonna spend trying to get better recruits? How, what are the first batch of CVs like? Are they good enough? Let's, are we gonna, maybe we should change the wording on the job ad because we're not quite getting, seeing the people that we want. I've, I've had a bunch of experience this in a, in, a, in a number of settings. Everybody struggles with it. Companies spend a ton of money recruiting because it's hard. You are never, or I've never been in a position where I'm just sitting there idly flipping through a hundred perfect resumes, <laughs> going, oh, I don't know, one of, just bring me one of these perfect <laughs> That isn't what it's like. You sometimes are sifting through a, a, a huge amount of resumes, and I've certainly done that. Um, Let me ask you guys really quickly. Okay, if there are jobs, what job, what, which role at a game company do you think is there most demand for right now in New York City? Let's just say locally. Unity coders. Unity coders? Yeah, I'd say programmers. Yeah, generally, yeah. Sorry, everyone. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. I don't Tony jobs. doesn't know. Matia? <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't, yeah, we're, we don't generally look for Unity. What we actually look for as often as game designers. But, uh, game designers? <laughs> we're, we're, we're and that and, way, and like. second, and second choice from the, from the three of you? Actually, I would say uh, UI, UX. UI, oh, UX. Yeah, that's User experience yeah. designers, right? Yeah. Let's say like graphic designers. Graphic designers? I mean, it's, it's not a rare job, but it's absolutely brilliant producers yeah. are still gold dust and and people will hire them when they haven't even got jobs for them and that you, you usually need some experience to demonstrate that but if you can start to build up a, a kind of convincing case that you're somebody who could be can. a producer so i think the good news is that we heard game design programming visual design and producing right the whole spectrum so the jobs are out there i just have to warn you guys we've got a lot we've got a lot more content you guys are all very smart and talkative like like me so we have to let's try to keep our, let's try to keep our answer short because I want to get to the Q&A and everything. So, um, so Tony, you put this here. Who, you, you need a degree. <laughs> so, 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 ten words on that. <laughs> um, I do a lot. Of, I've been doing a lot of contract work lately. Ninety percent of the people I work with absolutely do not have degrees in game design. In game design. Okay. Yeah. Um, and they're incredibly talented people who know what they're doing. Um, did the NYU Game Center in any way prepare you for your career? <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be, I, I absolutely would not be where I am today without the the myth that it's getting easier for women. I, I mean, I, 10 words. Um, 
e easier, sure. I think there's a there's a whole you know even though just the sitting in this room today is a different room from the room that I was sitting in ten years ago. But I think um, as a as a female candidate and as somebody who's now on the other side of it, I think there's still a tendency to to mentally slot women into producer roles, into marketing roles, um, into art roles maybe, um, and I think. Uh, as a woman candidate, it's good to have a really clear vision of yourself in terms of where you want to take your career to. If you want to be a creative director, if you want to be a tech lead, if you want to end up in those positions, don't be afraid to start broadcasting that. You're going to have to start at the bottom and work your way up, but stake a claim to that territory. Um, and and be, be prepared that you're going to be confronted with people's stereotypes about what a man yeah. does well, what a woman does well. Yeah. Okay, great. I think that's a great point. Um, let's move on to some myths. I think this might be our final uh, myth screen. Myths about uh, developing games. So uh, some of these themes we, we, we started talking about. Um, I think that, uh, uh, do any of you want to comment on any of these? Uh, Grant, several of these were, were yours. I think, that you, I think that you basically said that people don't realize how important process is. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely, at this point, I love process, and I'm like really into, I don't know, how you organize, what features you're going to work on, and I, I worked really closely with my product managers a lot of times, uh, and, and it just, it makes things so much more clear, and so much more valuable, like, how to actually get things created. Uh, as a student, I was kind of just, I don't know, just trying to make stuff for class, and <laughs> like, hit those types of deadlines, but it was always like the last couple days that I'd really start like working on it. Um, <laughs> and it's just not true whenever you're like in a more professional setting. Once you actually have these processes in place, it's, things go so much more smoothly, um, and I had no idea about a lot of them. Howard, I see you nodding. Do you want to add to that? No, or? I, think, I think for an indie team especially, really, time is basically not on our side because time equates to money. I mean, the more time we spend, the more money it costs, right? So I think for us, really having a, a great process is crucial. And I think if we can have, like, for us, if we have people who think about how to improve the process, it's even more beneficial instead of just like, okay, I'm just gonna do right. my thing, check out my tasks. So I think one thing I'm hearing is that if you're, if you're looking for a job and someone talks to you about talking to you about your experience making games, being aware that of the importance of process, it's already a clue, okay, this person gets it, right? They don't think it's sitting around coding features, they don't think it's sitting around kicking, just kicking ideas around that. A focus on the process, and when we say process, we mean things like, how often and when do you meet? What's your documentation like? What are you using to, tra uh, to track tasks? Uh, th things like that, things yep. that a producer does, right? Um, I thought I thought these were kind of funny. Maybe we don't need to discuss them, but some of you said, I think, Grant, you may have said, yeah, get your documentation of your work because yeah. your social game may be evaporated off of, you know, Facebook and suddenly you realize you never actually got a video of it running yeah. uh, and, it'll, and it'll never be up on that, that server again. Yeah. And also that, that sometimes you work on stuff and it just never, never gets released. So those are, I think those are, uh, those are, those are good points. Tony, you had the, the last point there. So I think that's a nice thing, right? That's a myth, and yeah, you're saying that the, the, the community is, is supportive, right? So what, what kind of support are you finding from, yeah. from the, the development community? Yeah, I, tr I definitely tried to make sure I had a positive myth in there. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is just like so far, like doing, being an indie designer with a studio for like eight months. Um, so far, it's been incredibly easy to find people to give us feedback and advice um, just by asking. Um, I think if you put yourself out there and say, look, I'm, you know, where you were five years ago, how did you do X or Y? If you ask specific questions, people are really happy to share their experiences um, on a lot of different things from like, you know, design stuff to how to fill out an RFP to, you know, getting funding from other sources. And it's really good. To, so just like asking those questions and like knowing that people might not get back to you right away, but Sometimes they'll put you in touch with other people. Right. I think so. I, and I think th this this point, I'm really glad you made it because this is part of the hard work that I mentioned. Right. The idea that you are, it's not just about finding the job and landing at a desk. It's about being part of a community of people that are maybe doing the same thing as you, maybe a little bit ahead of you, maybe a little behind you, but you maybe you can share resources and, and give feedback and share expertise. Yeah. Um, I think that's a nice point. So. Um, let, let's uh, let's let's move on from myths <coughs> to 
Talk about what you're looking for when you're hiring an employee, staff, intern, coworker. Um, so uh, I found your I found your uh, responses really interesting, and I wanted to start with this one, which is sort of two ways of, of saying the same thing. This was Howard and Margaret, I think. Mm. That basically, the main thing is have you actually done something, right? So so I I guess I guess uh, do you want either one of you want to elaborate on what what you meant by that? Yeah, I mean I think. Obviously, if someone's, if we need a programmer, we'll be looking, we'll be asking very specific questions about, you know, what the person's experience is and, you know, knowledge and, and skill base and, and whatnot. But then, more than that, we're also looking to see if that person's done a project. What, like, you know, what part of the project did he do? And to see if that person actually has practical experience working on the project, building something, creating something, and getting something um, I, I would say that means to us anyway more than just you know the bullet points on the resume. I guess for me, I remember hiring people at my company, Game Lab. You would you would find someone and say, "I love game design. I think about games all the time. I I live my life to make games." I would say, "Okay, do you have a game you've made?" Uh, no, I'm not a programmer, don't have technical skills. Okay, a little card game, a little board game, you've never actually made a game. So that this is kind of going to this point, right? That if you if you really love something, showing that you've completed something, that you can get it done, I think. And is I think on, on top of that, uh, uh, going back to like making board uh, board games and non-digital games, um, try if you can to get just a quick video of it. Uh, or even if you just like post the rules, like posting rules is kind of nice. We can read through them, and like I like seeing that kind of project is really good. Um, but even just a quick video of how to play the game, uh, because it does two things. It shows that you created the game, which is all good. Uh, it gives me an idea of, of what it is, but it also shows me how you communicate your rules uh, if you're talking me through how to play it. Uh, and communication is key. Uh, it's the biggest thing as far as what you often do in game design. Uh, so if you can do both of those in a nice little video, that's awesome. Uh, Grant, you are our segue king because you also uh, <laughs> you took us right right to this uh, right to this next slide in terms of what 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 people are looking for. Um, so we the next one is on skills. Skills and personality kind of overlap a little bit, but um, these are more maybe slightly softer things. So what I thought was really interesting is that this resourcefulness and flexibility, all five of you had that in common. I think that was the one thing that everybody really agreed on in terms of what you're looking for. Do any of you want to want to want to comment on that? Sure. Uh, yeah, so th I mean, this is resourcefulness is probably the most important in some ways the most important thing for us. Uh, and that's because we're a small company. I mean, this obviously would apply even to larger ones, but at small companies it's particularly important. Uh, people have to wear lots of different hats. Uh, I I do uh, game design, but I also do programming. Uh, I also do accounting. I also do uh, pretty much anything else under the sun. Uh, my, my partner does uh, art, so like everybody has to wear lots of hats. Wait, let me, let me, I'm gonna stop you. This is always a really important question. So do you think it's better for someone to specialize and get really good at one thing, or is it better for them to try and get good at a whole bunch of things in a less deep way? I mean, it depends on what your what your goals are. All right, Margaret? Both. 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 Okay. Yes, yes, yes and, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I know for, for small companies it's important it depends what your goals are. I, I can imagine, and I, I don't know, I don't have any direct experience working in the in the AAA end of the of the industry. But I can imagine if you want to be a graphics programmer, probably specialization, like right. they're, like you want to work on on the high end uh, AAA titles, like that's probably something you have to do. They're very very highly specialized. I think large the, companies. The rule of thumb is yeah, the larger the company, the more specialized yeah. you need to be. Right. And then the more opportunity there is to work up your your, your way up a, a hierarchy. Whereas in small companies, everybody gets to do every but everything, but has to do everything. Uh, but there's less opportunities for uh, for sort of growth within the company, uh, going through all the, the, the latter. Let, let me ask you guys a question, because I think these all make sense when they say them. you're interested in learning, you're a good listener, um, a good fit with the company culture. How, how do you demonstrate these things? Like where where does it, where, like if you're looking for someone, looking for these things, how, how does someone try and communicate this to you in an interview or in a resume or, or when you run into someone at a party? Um, how how would you give these people advice to be able to embody this kind of personality? Any suggestions? It's a tough question. I don't know. I mean, I, to be honest, I think that's that's the that's the question for the interviewer. I think yeah. your job as someone who's recruiting uh -huh. is to set up an environment yeah. that allows somebody to to relax and yeah. and open up and and be themselves and talk about what they know, what they care about. 
I mean, I think what I would say is if you are applying for a role that you're really excited about and you feel you're a good fit for and you don't feel like you've had an opportunity to do that, you've got nothing to lose. I'd get back in touch and say, hey, look, could we have a follow up cup of coffee? Is there a different kind of conversation we could have? I didn't feel like the, the first job I got in games, I screwed up the interview so badly. I went to the pub afterwards to drink heavily <laughs> because I was so embarrassed. And the guy who interviewed me showed up at the pub. And in the pub, I was like, so the thing I should have said was that this is really interesting and you should do that and all the rest of it. And I got the job, I think, largely because... <laughs> and it's true, because in the interview, I was like super nervous and frozen and didn't manage to say anything. And I well, was you're a charming drunk. I but it But it was kind of a really good lesson that... The, you know that if you if you feel like sure, doing a good interview is not is not an easy thing for the interviewer and there's a whole bunch of technical legal things that make it even more complicated if you feel like you haven't had a chance you know see see if you can if you can get another shot of that so for in persistence, the company's interest persistence pays off i remember yeah. that too the people that would email you know oftentimes it's just about getting the right email at the right time, right? You're looking for somebody to say, hey, we just got this email from someone who interviewed with us six months ago. I never would have dug it, that person's resume out of a stack, but they're kind of perfect for what we're looking for. So persistence does help. Any other suggestions about how you, yeah, Tony? Great, having hired approximately zero people, um, this is just what I imagine <laughs> I would be going for is, um, and this is, more specifically for like a small like indie place like we would probably never go through the same sort of process as like a bigger place um so i would say like someone who i was familiar with because of their involvement with the community like someone whose name i had heard or like seen on twitter like actively engaging and showing that they knew what was going on they were interested um you know were like volunteering at festivals or like showing stuff that Play test Thursday or demo nights, stuff like that. Just like a presence. Um, the I guess the lab, maybe the one thing I want to pull out before I move on is how I think you were saying that when you're hiring someone for a company, what you don't realize is that you may be sitting in a room with that person <laughs> all day. You're gonna see that people in that room more than you see your 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 spouse or children or whatever, right? Like <laughs> all the time. So the, the the question is like how what does it mean a good fit with the company culture? I mean, yeah, I think that probably depends on the team, right? I mean, for us, just speaking for us, we're pretty quirky. I mean, we have people doing weird stuff. Um, uh, you know, we have like you know weird manners and stuff all the time. But I, I feel like so for us, I mean, I can't you know hold ourselves on a pedestal and say like, oh, okay, I demand you to be really smooth in an interview and super well spoken. Um, but I think what we're mostly looking for is just if that person is himself, if that person is really you know, honest about what they did and you know, hopefully some, someone that we can trust. Um, and I think that kind of relationship or connection means to us anyway a hell of a lot more than if somebody is like super you know, well-spoken and you know, really smooth in an interview. All right, and I actually think Margaret's anecdote kind of yeah. is a good illustration of that, right? Like in the, if you can get comfortable with someone at the company and be more straightforward with them, it's it's better than sort of trying trying too hard to do the right thing. I'm, yeah. I'm really not advocating turning up drunk. <laughs> 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 Noted. Uh, all right, so let's let's move uh, towards the towards the right skills. Um, I think that uh, Grant, you already mentioned that 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 communication is really key. So you yeah. talked about doing a video of your uh, of, of a game, for example. But but I, I think several of you mentioned that communication is really important. Um, is, that, is that something that people don't realize going into the game industry, you think? Yeah, I think it's, it's, I thought it was really interesting, like, especially once getting in, how flexible I had to be to communicate to different audiences, right? And within your company. Uh, so different teams, I had some teams that weren't native English speakers, I had some teams that didn't play all the same games as myself, and they, we didn't have the same background. Um, and so being able to be, this kind of goes back to the, the last slide, I guess, but being able to be flexible and change the style in which you communicate for different audiences is huge. Now, how to show that is a little difficult. Um, I think this really comes down to in interviews, uh, and that's kind of a good to the interviewer, uh, or inter yeah, the, the interviewee. Interviewer, whoever asking the questions. Uh, and, yes. 
Um, but it, it comes down to, you know, being able, trying to get at, if you're getting interviewed, trying to get at how you've tackled certain problems in different ways, uh, and, and you're, you've shown that you can, you're able to be flexible. Mattia, you mentioned empathy for players, or a kind of a player-centric point of view. I mean, what, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so one of the most common, at least in my experience, one of the most common uh, sort of failure states of design is when people get become sort of bewitched by their own cleverness and their own systems and uh, and, and start becoming so obsessed about their own, uh, that, that, oh, this is just so great. And, but what you're actually doing at that point is you're ant farming. You're not really, like, you're not really concerned about the, the actual player experience. You're just concerned about, like, moving people through some system that you've designed. Uh, and that's actually, like, a very hard thing to teach. Like, you can teach people how to become better systems designers and how to balance those numbers better or worse. And th those are skills that are, that are easier to develop. Empathy for players is a little bit harder to, to do, and so the if you have that and people are, are able to develop that, that is a that is a great thing. I, th I think because there's a lot less. You have a, a huge sort of a leg up on most other uh, designers. That, that that is a that is a thing you can build on very easily compared to the other skills. Yeah, Howard, you actually mentioned I think that sometimes you you like people that say, "Hey, I've waited tables at a restaurant yeah. because that means they can actually understand other people's point of view." Yeah. So our, our community manager right now, how did he become a community? He was just basically a player in the game, um, and he wanted to volunteer. So you know, so he was just helping us out, and then he interned with us, and then he worked with us part time, and now he's working with us full time as our community manager. And what, how that whole process got to be, or how how he decided to bring him on into the community managers, because you know he, I got the sense that he understands service, and I think when when you're running a multiplayer game, um, especially this is our like third year now. Um, service is actually key because I mean this is something that like I never thought about you know it's like okay we create a game we, we release it out there um, but year year three as I mean as, as the game is out you realize that okay wait players demand actually demand to be served as customers which is like a total novel concept to me. Yeah. Um, but then you know so he he just said like so you know I asked him like hey do you have any experience like yeah I waited a table at Olive Garden he was telling me about all these like you know horrible service experience and how you dealt with it, I'm like, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I think in that sense, skills transfer. Margaret, you're nodding in agreement. Yeah, I think it's, well, I was, it's oddly what's in my head is the only, the, I think the only truly transferable, almost essential skill in any role that I always get a little bit spooked when somebody can't do is Excel. Excel is, like, I don't know if you guys find this, but so many bits of your studio end up running on it. <laughs> But, um, Excel or spreadsheets in general. Now maybe Google spreadsheets. You no, still, still kind of just Excel. Excel. Yeah, the coding. Um, the so screen. never, never be scared to mention that. Like it's, it's a test question I often use when I ask people how they do things, and if they do it in Excel, they get a little secret plus one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But um, yeah, I think I, I mean I think in terms of the in terms of the have you made games, I'm always looking for that. Other than that, just to kind of group together a bunch of things we've already mentioned. I don't care about anything else about where you come from. What I care about is what, you're, what impact you're gonna have when I sit you down in my studio. That's mm -hmm. what I care about. So whether or not you have a degree, whether or not you, you know, your, your experiences in a, in a restaurant or in another game studio, I just don't care. It doesn't matter. What matters is when you walk, you know, because right, this kind, of, kind of getting back yeah. to this point, right? Like what, yeah. are you, what are you gonna actually do at yeah, my company? Yeah, because it's, you know, I, I, I say yes to you and two weeks from now on Monday, you walk in the door and you know, by the Friday of that week, some things are going to have happened or have not happened, and that's those. That's what I care about right now. That's why I hired you. And so everything I'm trying to do is is suss out your ability to get those things done. And anything that you can show me that helps me believe that that's going to happen is relevant. I don't care what any of those things are. I just care about whether or not I get convinced. Yeah, I think I think you said something like enthusiasm and good intentions are valuable resources, but I don't really care. If at the end you're saying like, well, I couldn't really get get done what I needed to get done. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Matteo was saying resourcefulness. Like, you know, if I come back at the end of the week and you go, oh, well, I worked really hard, but I couldn't fix the problem. That's just that's bad. That's bad news, right? I, I, that's not that's not going to get the job done. So you're looking for people who are either going to come to you on Tuesday and say this isn't going to work. I think we should do this instead, right. or are going to come back to you on Friday and go, I figured out a different way. This is this works. Now we can do this. And I, I think this is a super important point because it, with jobs and with internships, this is almost like a, a, um, 
a myth that uh, another myth that people have. People often approach internships like, oh, what am I going to get out of it? What what are you going to provide me, company? What are how are you going to make sure that I'm doing fulfilling work? Whereas a company, especially in New York, game studios are generally small. They're struggling, even if they're funded. There's a lot of competition on your back, you know, and, and the doors may close. People are looking for you because you are providing them skills and abilities and you're gonna be part of a team doing things. And the wrong attitude to have is like, is this gonna be fun about, you know, you, you have to think about what the company needs and how you're gonna meet those needs. And I think if you go in with that attitude, you're gonna end up, you wanna be the, you wanna be the, you know, the peg that fits into their, the puzzle that they're trying to put together. Yeah, I mean, and this goes to resourcefulness. I, mean, I think it's very important with internships that if, if you are very, you should try to jump in with both feet and try to get things done. Because if you're constantly asking like, oh, where's the stapler? How do I do this? How do I do that? And like, <laughs> at that point, it's like, if I have to manage you more, if I have to spend more time managing you than I get out of uh, working with you, then it's it's not working for me. It's a, a, a many little advantage out of it. Uh, it's also showing me that you're not very resourceful, which is a problem down the line when if, if I were to choose to hire you. Right, so, so, so confidence, uh, some kind of track record, of, of actually accomplishing things and all, all yeah, of Yeah, and an, include, an ability to just be willing to jump in, like, I'm gonna try to get this thing done. I'm gonna find the stapler. I'm not gonna ask you, I'll, I'll store it out. I will build a stapler. Yeah. I will build a stapler. Build a stapler. Yeah. I'm gonna staple it with my fists. <laughs> okay, so so uh, the, the last thing that we're looking for is someone that gets the big picture. Um, so this were some of the things that, that, that you guys brought out. Um, someone with interest outside games, that they, they respect difference and diversity, and that they have some kind of cultural savvy. Any of you wanna comment on these? No, self-evident, Margaret? Just, just, that, just that they're vital resources. I mean, that's the thing, when you're a studio, you're this little box of people, and everything you make is made out of that little box of people. And the more things those people can do, and the more stuff those people know about, and the better they are at communicating it to each other, the better stuff you'll make. And that's all, that's all there is to it. I think before you start working, and certainly before you get to a level of seniority in a company, companies just seem like these kind of magic, self-sustaining organisms that have this life of their own, and, and your level of concern is, can I get the job that I want or not? When you get a little bit further up, you discover that companies are just this completely fictional, make-believe, temporary structure that only exists <laughs> as long as they're generating a little bit more money than they're spending every month, and they're just made of the people in the box. That's that's the whole thing. And so the richer that box from the people is, the more likely it is that you still have a paycheck in a year. So, so you, yeah. you would encourage people to like say, oh, I know these languages, or I've traveled around the world this way, or I study this theater or martial arts or whatever other interests are, that, that does that make a candidate more attractive? Yeah, I mean, I would think so. I mean, especially now that we're looking for, looking to localize, like in preparation to, on console, if someone speaks French, perfect. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so. um, I, 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 also, I think in my experience, a lot of those, a lot of those things can make you really memorable as a person. Oh, remember this resume? This was the, this was the person who said they got you know, whatever. Were lost in Thailand for a week. Um, you know, whatever, it, whatever it was. Um, any, any, any. <laughs> that's horrible, right? <laughs> but memorable. Uh, okay, so. Um, uh, I think what's interesting, if I if I if I look back at all of these, they're you know if they're the right personality, you know that you've done things. None of you are saying I'm looking for someone with a PhD in computer science. I'm looking for someone with five years experience in the industry. These are all kind of so, they're sort of softer, right? They're like they're about communication, resourcefulness, getting the big picture. So. So I think that that's probably good news, right? That's maybe good news for someone saying, well, I've never, I've never made a published game before, a commercially published game. But, but when I look at this list, it seems like if you can demonstrate that, that you have the right kind of attitude and you sort of get it on all of these different levels, then, then it's possible. Yeah, I'd also say I heavily, heavily encourage you to promote your games. Uh, and that's not to be like egotistical about them, right? Promote, like, you mean a, like I, an indie game or student game they may have made? Right, so uh, I'm like kind of assuming that you'll make one of these projects uh, that we'll be looking at. And if you can, try to find it by any means possible to promote it in any way. And what I mean by this is like, look at all sorts of different festivals, uh, look at all sorts of different like play crafting, right? And this is like a, a, a community of like, uh, I don't know, different meetings and organizations.
organization that you can put your game in and just show other people. And this highlights your work, but also shows that you kind of have that, you know, that, that you kind of, you'll go after like showing yourself off, I guess. Uh, and it's hugely important, I think. Uh, another good echo of, of things Tony has brought up about yeah. community, I think, and, and, and being there, and also communication, right? It's, it, there's a difference between someone saying, well, download my student game, and someone right. saying, go to my public website, where we put together a nice presentation on it. Yeah. Um, so uh, to finish up this, this, this portion, I wanted to have you guys do, do lightning advice. So I'm gonna, we're going to go down the row. It, oh, start there? Because you're not, you're not allowed to repeat, so then you're going to have to come up with zero, right? So I want to hear, I want to hear your number, these guys don't know what's on the next, what, what, the, what these are. I want to hear your number one answer from, from their point of view for number one advice for finding jobs. Where do you find them? I would strongly encourage you guys to attend to events like this, be at cons, or just be at events, just talk to people. I mean, I'll say, Okay, next we'll see if we'll yeah. see if more come out. Uh, Margaret. <laughs> Company websites. Company yeah. websites. Go to school. The, the degree doesn't matter, but actually going to school in the process of it is actually a very good way to meet people uh, <laughs> and <laughs> defining jobs. Okay. Uh, use Twitter. Use Twitter. Okay. Any other quick quick responses? Did you get up? Yeah. Everything you wanted. Okay. So <laughs> events, uh, company websites, which often list uh, jobs for hire. All right, all right. Resume and cover letters. Best advice. Tony. Update mine, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, get out of here. Matia, best uh, advice for preparing a resume and cover letter? Keep it short. To keep the it point. Short and to the point. They're they're really important. I know they're boring, but they're really important. They they are how I gauge your ability to communicate and produce documentation within the company. I don't care about your resume as a resume, but I care about it as evidence of your ability uh. to produce a thing to a decent standard and communicate effectively. Yeah, I would say on top of that, treat it as a design problem in and of itself, right? You want to communicate yourself, you want to show off yourself as an individual uh, that can work well in this company, treat it like a design problem like you would anything else. Although don't make me an org that I have to solve. Uh, <laughs> no, keep it simple. <laughs> I think projects, and actual projects are more important. Uh, highlighting that. But, but if you're sending me a project, make sure I understand what you did on it, what you think yeah, was valuable yeah. about it. Like, right, right, right. package it for me. Don't just send me a link to a thing that I try and download and then it doesn't work and I don't know what <laughs> you played on it. Yeah, I actually, I had I had portfolios next. So, okay. so anything else on portfolios, Mattia? Uh, yeah, make sure that there's rules with it and it's very clear what I have to do with it if you're sending me the games that I have to play. But I mean, basically, sorry, I'll repeat it, I guess. I would use GIFs. If, like super yeah. useful if you can, because a still image doesn't really well communicate like what how your game like moves and stuff uh, and transitions. Um, if you can find a good gift, like just put it to YouTube and then use some tools online. Uh, put it online. It's good. Don't have a super fancy art website that I can't navigate. <laughs> I was going to say videos, but I think gifts are too Better. similar for that Maybe, yeah. second answer. Okay. Um, and we kind of did this already. Interviews. Uh, any any more best advice for interviews? Just a fifth of whiskey. Just a hip blast. For a crust. My advice from Margaret Listen, Robertson. Listen, <laughs> the, the, the old you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you thing is kind of infuriating, but there's some truth in it. Like if I. If in the questions that you're asking me, I see that you're really thinking about and understanding what it might mean to work with me in this studio, in this role, it helps me imagine you in the role and it helps me believe that you really want this and that you're really understanding it. So, like even the really stupid questions of, you know, if I got the job, where would I work? What are your, you know, what, what are your hours like? What's the company relaxation culture like? Do you guys hang out together? Is there, are there games that you tend to play in the office? What? You know, are you? Is this a company that has a lot of meetings? What kind of tools do you use to, to organize your process? There's a ton of stuff you can ask. The way that I, I mean, I, I don't have to go through the interview process so much now that I'm I'm a bit further advanced in my career. But the questions that I ask now are totally different from the questions that I asked asked 50 years ago, where you were, you know, you're kind of very hesitant. So I, I I do think you know get get involved, be excited, and 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 forward invested in the job and try and figure out what being there would really be like. I would say heavily prepare. 
uh, actually know what the company does and know the games or whatever they have made. Uh, and also, if you are going to ask those types of questions like that kind of come off as like, what do I get out of it? Back, like backload them, right? Put them more, once they're right. more invested in yourself and they say, oh, I could see this person as a candidate, uh, then you can start like- Yeah, don't start notes. the interview there. Yeah. It's like starting a date by saying, okay, are you gonna pay for the check or should I pay for the check? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like, don't wanna story? just kind of get to know <laughs> each other first. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, super dumb, basic, but useful advice, practice out loud. Yeah. yeah. Start it's in really your bathroom good. and and interview uh, yourself. Talk, 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 get it into your mouth because the, up here, it doesn't count. Ah, speak, speak, prototype speak. and iterate, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, anything else for interviews? Uh, I think bring stuff with you. Like, if you have like a prototype or like a little thing on your phone or whatever, I think mm. it's okay to bring that. Totally. Be ready to show. Be yeah. ready to show. Like, like charge your phone. Maybe yeah. have two. Like, like practice like, running just it be on ready. Computer yeah. Tech will mess up always. Yeah. Um, okay. The last screen is. Uh, this, these are some resources, I think, for for finding events and jobs and uh, in the in the New York City area. These are all things that you can either either look up or um, NY Gaming Meetup is now called uh, Playcrafting. Playcrafting, right? But if you if you, if you yeah, look that up, the on Facebook there's a ton of great lists: NYC Game Dev, Indie Games, NYC Game Industry. Um, I'll, I'll just leave this up. Wow, this is, you know, I, I feel like a paparazzi or a um, I would, All right. I would also say, yes. if, if they don't say they have like a game design position, it's still okay to reach out to them. And I would even encourage that. I know people who have like reached out to people that are looking for just programmers, right? Maybe game programmers. And they said, oh, well, if you're also looking for a designer at any point, let me know. And they've got positions that way. Right. Uh, so. It's a very, it's a so, very tricky device because you don't want to seem like I'm clueless. I know yeah. you're not. But if you can seem passionate, like I know you're not looking for programmers. I just want you to say I love your games. I've been playing them for right. years. I, you know, you're doing such interesting work. And so I'm just sending out just in case. Uh, hold on to my resume if you don't. So there's a very. It all depends on the attitude and the way you approach someone. Right. If you if you seem like okay, I get it. I know you're not hiring, but as opposed to you know, you should love me. Yeah. I didn't read your job ad. You know, I don't really know who your company is. So um, let's let's open it up for for Q and A. Any questions about anything deeper on something we discussed? This is your chance. Yes. So I know you guys said that um, you know not everything into a job. It, 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 it's a game into the industry. It's like oh, you need to have five years of experience with this or this or that. But um, do you have any advice in terms of just trying to like really get like a beginning job? In I've done trying to search this and try to see what I can find, and I find out most of what I, I find online, maybe I'm just not looking in the right places, seems to be asking for that type of experience. Exactly. It, like a few years in the game industry. Um, so you're just saying, where do I go to find the entry level jobs? Is that is that right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and just and how do, how do you solve the chicken and egg experience problem that you can't get a job till you've got five years experience, but you can't get five years experience till you get a job? I mean, I think feel like that job ad is just a thing somebody made up. Somebody in the middle of a busy day had somebody nag them going, oh, we haven't posted that job yet, and they went, oh god, and they opened a word document and they were like, oh, what do we want? They copied it from something else. Yeah, they're not they're not especially meaningful. So your job when you look at that job ad is to think. What is it that this person needs to get done? Yep. And can I do it? And how do I show them that they can do it? And it's, it's very rare, particularly with a small to mid-sized studio, that somebody is gonna turn away an applicant that they really believe can get the job done just because they don't tick one of the boxes on that thing that they wrote. So you need to be being sensible. If somebody is looking for a producer with 10 years experience who's launched a bunch of commercial product, projects and you've never done that, you're very unlikely to know the stuff that that person needs to know. But if you look at a job and think that person needs somebody who can, you know, do this do this bit of design work or work effectively in this programming language or whatever it is, and you think you can show them why you can do that, apply. Apply but write and say, look, I haven't got this, but I've got this, and I haven't got this, but here are three things I've made that show that I'm good at it. So that's yeah, a certain kind of confidence, but not blind confidence. Yeah. It's right. confidence knowing and, and meanwhile vol volunteer for stuff. Yep. Everywhere yeah. you can. Yeah, I, I was just gonna just for Howard speaks. I was gonna say one trick is 
trying to figure out what kind of experience you can get that's not a real paying job. Indicate is happening this weekend. Right. Are you one of our students is the volunteer coordinator? I would say like, whoa, this person is not only in the middle of the community, but they're also taking on responsibility. You did something at a game jam. Maybe you won an award. Um, you you didn't just design a game. You have it up online with a nice looking print and play. And there's actually a little community asking questions. And I'm like, whoa, this person's got some players that like their games. So trying to figure out how can you volunteer for stuff, become parts of organizations. Those are ways to sort of get experience. You never want on your resume to lead with education. That's always the sign of a student. Put education at the bottom. <laughs> you want your experience to be bigger than your education part, right? How do you how do you get that experience part bigger? Oftentimes it's not it's not a real job, but it's doing these volunteer things or winning awards, creating product projects and putting them out there. Um, Howard, sorry. Right, so if I look at a job posting, I think the assumption, like what when I see a line item is oh X years of experience. I mean, the assumption is that that whatever years of experience translate to actual something, um, you know, whether it's skill set, knowledge base, or some accomplishment. So I think demonstrating that is actually way more than getting hung up with, oh, I don't have three years of experience. Because here's um, the here's the other thing: if if you can do the job that I need done, but you're five years younger and five years cheaper than the guy who can take those boxes, <laughs> I'm going to hire you. <laughs> That's a real thing. But you need to be able to show me that you can get it done. It's a good question. It kind of gets to the heart of what I think what a lot of people are thinking about, which is like the, the chicken and egg question, as Margaret said. Yeah. So piggyback off of that, um, how much do you allow for like learning on the job? Anybody? Anyone want to talk about that? I, I think it. I think it depends on the position. So I've I've had a number of interns that I've managed, and a, a lot of them would come in not necessarily knowing how to use like a wireframe or build their own like you know certain loops or, or certain presentations. Um, and I and I knew that coming in, right? We we talked about it. It was something that we both had kind of like negotiated, I guess. Um, and part of that position, what I wanted them to get out of it, while also like assisting me along the way, was to learn those certain tools and to learn how to like thrive in that kind of space. Um, but I think it definitely depends on the type of position. I probably wouldn't expect that as much from like maybe a more senior position. Um, but definitely for certain internships, I think, and that, that's a good thing to maybe back it, like at the end of your interview is be like, hey, well, I'm also really interested in learning these certain things. I've taken steps to show that I've, I'm already like, like learning them, but I am like wanting to learn more, I guess. Mattia, were you gonna address that yep. learning on the job? Well, yeah, basically, I would second what, uh, uh, what Grant said that, yeah, there's, a, the, the, the more junior the position, the more space there is uh, for, for learning on the job. But, I mean, with us, because the stuff that we do, like I said, is we don't have a lot of specialization, and we're, we're people are sort of jo jumping around uh, disciplines a lot and uh, wearing lots of different hats. Like, there's the expectation that it's not important whether you're, you're a specialist in any one thing, but your ability to be able to jump into different situations and be able to respond, be a problem solver, like that's more important, and so we expect people to, to learn on the job. Right, so, I mean, if you're in an interview and someone says, can you do this thing, and you know, you could say, oh no, I can't really, maybe I could learn on the job, but if you say, I guess to like a communication, well, you know what, I don't know PowerPoint, but I'm a keynote wizard, yeah. <laughs> so I have no problem picking that up. Just a difference in the way you're presenting yourself. Yeah, or, I mean, you know, I think, there is that reality that particularly, well anywhere really, you need to have the core skill that the person is looking to fill in that role. And you're gonna have a really hard time, unless it's an internship, getting around that problem. But in, in, if you're just slightly off center in some regard, or there's a, a thing you haven't done yet, sh show me that you're good at learning. Like maybe you can't do this thing, but talk to me about how last year you picked up this new programming language, or you know, this summer you've never designed a real world game, so you did this, this, and this, whatever. Show me that you're good at learning stuff fast, and that I can trust you to kind of pursue that independently. And then, again, what that may do is that you then end up representing a really good value hire for me, because rather than having to hire somebody further on in their career, further up the skill tree, I can bring you onto the team now, and six months from now you'll be able to do all of that stuff, and then I'm thrilled to bits. But if it's, if it's really the core skill, you're unlikely to be able to get past that problem. Um, other, yeah, let's try and go fast so we can we can get to everybody. Yeah, in the back. Um, how long do you think it'll take to make a good size portfolio to start with? Uh, like six months, one year. In, in what discipline? In game design or art or? Uh, programming. 
You said make a good game proposal? Portfolio. Oh, portfolio. Yeah. Programming portfolio. I mean, I've seen very impressive games done at a game jam, right? Yeah. They've gotten yeah. people hired. So it, it, it's not, I don't think that there's, a, that there's a length of time. I will say this, it is, it is a thousand times better in someone's portfolio, this is my experience hiring people, to see one small, finished, yeah. playable, bug-free, with real instructions that you can actually play and enjoy game than some big project that they've been working on for months or years that clearly is kind of buggy and really ambitious, but they, it's just not there. Or a video of something which clearly isn't really working. So, so small, small, small things that are really done all the way. Yeah. You, look, if you're if you really want programming, lots of programmers think, oh, I have to have like an innovative game that's an indie. You don't actually. We I've seen great games that are just copies. Hey, I I recoded Tetris in 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 Java. And the, the one cool thing is that the audio is mixing in real time, and it's like, whoa, this person's got skills. They you know they can actually make a little game. So so. Focus on focus on small things that, that get to get and, the point. And don't necessarily hold off. Like if you come in and you say, I'm really excited about making games. This these are the skills I just taught myself. Here's a project I started last week and I finished it and it looks like this. It can be a tiny thing that you've done in a week, but now I know what you can do in a week. And that's pretty much all I care about, right? That's the way I'm worried. <laughs> it's what can you do in a week? So, you know, you may get the answer at that point, hey, you haven't got enough here, keep at it and and, and you know, let's talk further down the line. But don't feel like you've got to sit and wait for a year or two years or three years and kind of build up this big edifice of stuff. S start working, start making things, start finishing things. I can't echo Eric's thing strongly enough. Yeah. Um, and get out there. And just very quickly, the, the, in from a technical standpoint, at least what I, what I would look for is an ability to, I would want to see how you solve design problems. Not design like game design problems, but uh, coding problems. So for example, if you make Pong and then you can sort of talk me through like, why did you choose the, the, this particular architecture? Why, is it, why did you do an entity component system? Why, why that as opposed to something else? Or you know, if you can explain those kinds of decisions uh, and, and talk uh, and, and actually make arguments for them, like, oh, I decided to do this because in my experience, uh, it's much more flexible down, down the road and uh, it allows me to do certain things in, in graphics or in loading data uh, that much more easily. Like those things are, uh, are very important, much more important than having like a very polished like, oh, I, I created some kick-ass shader. Uh, that, 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 that stuff would be much more important to me because it means that you'll be able to learn stuff. You'll be able to be moved on to different things and, and be, pick them up quickly. Uh, more hands, yeah. Um, how would you describe uh, like, a, like just a basic example of process, like process in terms of development and like managing. In, so the question was how you would describe process, but you mean to be able to talk about it at an interview yes. or, yeah, so you're saying like, hey, I might be a good producer, but I don't exactly know what that means. Well, it's more like how do I explain myself <laughs> uh, intelligently at, at this point. And you haven't yet played that role. Right. Right. A any advice? I mean, I, I, often, I often ask people to show me how they work. So. It's, it's a thing you can just offer to do is is if you have projects that you've run or tools that you use be ready to talk about them and show them but i tend to be asking people kind of either about production process concepts so if somebody's run agile teams or uses kanban or whatever those things are or even if you don't talk about why you don't use them or why you don't like them or whatever else and then tools tools is often a really useful way you know, show me, show me how you, you talk to me about how you run a budget. Talk to me about how you how you run timelines or scheduling. Um, but but if, even if you haven't done that, any of that stuff, I mean, you may. I, I mean, I would say producers, really good producers, they they they're they're extremely detail oriented, right? So let's say there's someone who had no experience. You you may have, I don't know, but someone with no experience said, you know what? I really want to work work as a producer. I know I can help organize things. In high school, I helped organize the theater show as a stage manager every year. And then and then they said, I just want to show you my the way I organize my to do list. And it was like this super efficient comp. And I would say like, okay, this person's got the right right head to yeah. be a producer, right? I would remember that I'm, someone I'm, saying like, I want to show you my to do list. I'm so proud of it. I'm so organized. So there are ways that you can demonstrate those soft skills that we talked about, yeah. specifically towards organizing things. But, right? and, you have to be but, creative about it. And certainly being familiar, and a ton of these things you can you can trial for free or whatever, being familiar with tools that people are using, or using Trello, or using Slack, or using you know whatever else, it's it's just useful to, d to demonstrate a bit of fluency there. But uh, again, echo Eric, show, show me how you organize that high school thing or whatever. I just see how you work is useful. How yeah, are you? Would you, would you add? Second dive, uh, tools, very important. If you, tell me that you know you know how to use Trello. Well, okay, 
you get our entire production pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> for, for, for example, the Game Developers Conference, maybe you, you won't go there, but they have a whole uh, track that's just on uh, project management. You go there, just look at the talks that people are giving, right. even the titles. What tools are they talking about? Why don't you look them up? They're talking about Agile. What's Agile? Let me read about that. Oh, you've read an article about it, so at least you're coming with knowledge. So there are ways that you can start investigating a career path without without having to. Um, is is igda.com slash breaking in on here? That's a great site. We should put that up. That has a lot of resources too. I'm gonna add that. It's dot org. What? It's dot org. Dot org. Igda.org. It's not on here, right? No, I'll, I'll add it. I'll add it. Uh, another question. More hands. I'm trying to get around the crowd. Uh, uh, yeah, right here in the lecture. Um, any particular advice you would give somebody trying to get into game audio? Audio. Yeah, we haven't talked about audio. Uh, uh, have samples online, like having a little SoundCloud or something like that. Be, be really ready to talk um, process if you can. The, the a, a huge amount of what I'm usually looking for when I'm hiring game audio is not just can you make the amazing noises that I need you to make, but do you know how to get them into the software platform that we're using? Do you label everything clearly so we know what everything is? Are you able to turn around revisions quickly? Um, often, often that's the biggest part of the, the challenge. Are you? How do you show me that you're good at responding to briefs? Like, if you can send me a thing that goes, "Here's what the game director asked me for. Here's the email that I got saying this is what we need, and here's how I responded to that." All of that would be great. Can someone verify that that URL, by the way, <laughs> on their phone or something? Um, other advice for audio. The big question with audio is like. Do you, can there there aren't that many full time audio jobs, right? It's really more of a freelance. Yeah, I've, I've only ever hired freelance for audio. Yeah, so it's it's a it's it's a tougher path. Maybe having audio and thinking about another skill you could also develop. Hey, I'm audio, but I'm also a producer. Hire me, and I can I can do both. Yeah. You know. I mean, uh, but, but but equally, I know people making good livings doing freelance audio. It's a hustle, but it's a it's a it's it's a real need, and and no one else can like. There's a ton of other things that small studios can kind of muddle through themselves. Audio is really hard to do. You, you need you need someone who does it full time. Okay. Uh, next question. Yeah. In terms of like internships, what's the right level of competency? Like, at what point am I like being a burden, or at what point am I like do I have enough skills to like have a job there? Because I'm talking about like I might not have relevant skills, but I've been doing like a bunch of other different things. Like maybe I know how to code, but maybe I don't know how to. Games. So the question is, again, it's a kind of a chicken and egg type question, I think. As an intern, it just depends on the internship. I mean, if, if, you're in, if the internship is mostly about testing games, then you're qualified. But you never want to be a burden. You will, you will not be hired if the sense is that you're a burden, right? Yeah, and, and I mean, uh, and I suspect it's true for you. If you run a lot of live event games, I will have a ton of stuff that needs doing that is deeply zero skill. But it's, it's high resourcefulness and diligence. But there's just there's a ton of scut work involved in putting those things together. So if you show up and I realize you're the person who's going to be there at 8 a.m. with the things that I needed you to bring, and you're going to knuckle down and, and take cardboard boxes together for six hours because that's what it takes, then you're my dream come true. Right. right? On the so other hand, uh, if you're the person that shows up late, not not really having read the emails that she sent, you're you're just never going to be asked back, let alone get a job. So so those kinds of detail things are really important. yeah. Constantly looking for opportunities to show how you're resourceful. I mean, I think like live events are a perfect thing like that, where like anybody can figure out how to tape boxes. But looking around, like who needs something done? Where can I be useful? Rather than, than sitting around and just waiting, looking at your phone, uh, like just being very aggressive about trying to find stuff without pestering. Obviously, somebody like somebody's deep in in, in in something that needs to get done, and they have three people talking to them. They don't need to be like, excuse me, what can I do to help? Like <laughs> the, 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 those are moments to, uh, to to stay back. But yeah, generally try find opportunities to show that you're resourceful. Does, does, I, I know we have a lot of questions. Are there questions about a really different topic uh, that we haven't <laughs> that we haven't addressed yet? Yeah. Um, so this is kind of more skewed towards the indie um, companies, but. Uh, how do you go about gathering people to start an indie company? Uh, Tony, do you want to talk about that? You work with them on one assignment randomly. <laughs> <laughs> so for you, it was being in school. But I yes. think that, that what you're saying is you, you need to be part of a community, right? You're talking about how do you find collaborators. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. I mean, game, jams, game jams are a great, great, way, to, yeah, great yeah. way to meet people and test out. And, and conferences. My, my last yeah. EO, that collaboration came about through a, through a conference event. 
I, I was speaking, the guy who planned the studio was in the audience, we had a drink afterwards, then we worked together for five years, so, cool. you know. Twitter, I'm going to just say Twitter yeah. again. Twitter. The drinks are working for you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the secret to my success. <laughs> 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 All right, uh, <laughs> uh, next, next question, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, how do you get people to your games, like, how do you attract players? How do you attract players? More, more of a marketing question, uh, I mean, maybe we can just take this from the... Twitter. From, no, maybe we, can, <laughs> no, maybe we can take this from the point of view of someone who's trying to build a portfolio or a following, but any super quick advice? I looked at tons of, when I was just making like non-digital games, uh, I looked at tons and tons of events that actually were for that, right? Like, uh, like IndieCade, right? The great, great place that you can submit to and then maybe get in, that's awesome. Uh, but there's all sorts of other ones, or like Games for Change, they have all sorts of games you can do. Uh, IGF, or uh, yeah, the IGF. Uh, as well as like come out and play. Uh, yeah. There's just all sorts of different places, uh, but it does take a lot of effort to go in and just look for them, right? They exist. You just got to go out and kind of find them. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes it's kind of hard. It's another. There's no silver bullet. Like there's right. no secret to oh, I can get a million players this way. So it's just it's another thing where you. No, that's not true. It's very easy to get a million players a day. You just have to spend seven hundred fifty thousand yeah. dollars. Ah, oh, right. so you've got that money. Is the answer. So win the lottery. All right. So let's. So, so that was a question on a different topic, but not quite focused on on breaking into the game industry. So uh, a few more. We'll try and do very quick. We'll do like one person respond very quickly. Right. Try and get through them. Yeah. Go. What is the demand for artists in NYC, both 2D and 3D? And what skills do they need to have to uh, kind of make it the first job? Best advice for artists in NYC. My super quick answer would be middling high. Um, UI and UX design over illustration, good typography, uh, and, and good production. By, and, if, and if you're comfortable working in a slightly technical environment, that's great. If you're able to plug access into Unity or whatever, all the better. Next question. Would you have any different advice for somebody who already has a career in programming and is looking to transition into games? It's totally wide open. I mean, often right. programmers from other fields or, or industries are very extremely confident. Right? I mean, it's, not I, hard I, to get it's you. echoing a lot of this stuff. If if right. if I believe you can get the job done, then I then I don't care where your background is. I would I would come to things like this, hang out with people who are working in the field right now, and you find out what's different about the way they work from the way you work, and be ready to talk about yeah. that. All right, super fast. Super fast. What, there, there's. Some of the difference between if you're use of enterprise programming uh, versus the game industry. So there's there's a slight cultural difference, and understanding like how the, the, the those processes uh, work. So getting familiar with that stuff and being able to present your stuff in the context of the game less industry, engineering, uh, more hacking, sort of. Yeah, a little yeah. bit of that. Well, <laughs> 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 that's what it appears. Um, so there's been like a lot of talking about uh, how to like make yourself fit in with like a company culture. Um, on the other hand. How do you avoid like the exact opposite scenario of like maybe it's overstated, but um like the horror story of uh, entry level job in a uh, AAA studio and just crunch time, crunch time, crunch time, very low wage and pretty much getting walked all over. How do you how do you avoid getting the sort of the crunch job where you're getting walked all over? Yeah. Well, I mean, put it on your resume and find a new job, right? I mean, <laughs> you, yeah, I mean, do your research beforehand. If you find yourself in that situation, at least you've got an experience. Anyone want to add? Yeah, I mean, I've avoided it by avoiding AAA CEOs. <laughs> I think that, like, at least in, in, in an interview, you say, like, this is a pr prospective um, team or whatever. I mean, you can always, always ask them, like, what are your hours like? Yeah, ask in a way that hopefully. seems yeah. open ended, right? Not like yeah, a princess, yeah. but. Hopefully, they tell the right. truth. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, in New York, people generally work more than in other cities around the country, but that doesn't mean that you should have to work 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Any advice specifically for illustrators or concept artists trying to land a job in concept? Illustrators or concept artists, harder. It's harder road, right? Show me flexibility. Uh, it's, if, you're, if you're hiring somebody full time, especially as a smaller studio, I need to see a lot of range. Lots of different different styles, and yeah. and uh, that, that's good advice. Uh, more hands, yeah. Favorite interview question? To get or to give? To give. Yeah. Favorite interview question to give so they can prepare. Anybody? I, I mean, I, it's, it's boring, but I, I always ask people to tell me about a game they played recently that they really enjoyed. I hate the kind of your favorite game ever question, but it's really useful 
to hear somebody relax and get fluent talking about what they noticed about a thing they think. I would ask people what they like and didn't like. What were they yeah. doing to make the game better? Yeah, I, I like uh, asking about, like, tell me about your passion project that you worked on, right? What is the thing that you, you, you worked on that you liked the most, right? And then kind of break it down, right? And like, like tell me about it because I know you'll be comfortable with that. Uh, but then also, uh, yeah, just be really critical. Uh, any more questions? Yes. Any tips for writers? Writers. A, a million. Um, it's, it's super tough. Um, it's very competitive. Yeah. It's a little bit like game design or illustration. It's hard to just have only that skill. But again, show me process and context. Right. So don't send me a, a, a short story in an envelope and expect me to fall in love with it and hire you. Show me how how you were briefed. If you weren't briefed, imagine being briefed. Talk to people right. who are running games and ask them what it looks like when they brief somebody. Show me how you wrote a thing. Show me how you rewrite it. Show me how you took 20 lines of dialogue down to five lines because we had to shrink that. Show me how you wrote a thing to be read versus how you wrote it to be voice acted. Show me that you're serious about... The um, craft of writing. Yeah, the, the full craft, which, which these days is likely to range from like community blog posts all the way through to, 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 to voice work or, or casting or whatever. So get serious about the craft. Did you have a question earlier? Yeah, yeah. So how relevant is modding and mods on your portfolio? Modding in your portfolio is a question. How relevant? As a, as a designer? Yeah. Very high. Yeah. I think if, you, if you've if you made a thing that's a, you know, we're talking again and again about making games. If that's how you've chosen to make a game, awesome, but make it good and finish it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, final question, maybe? Or uh, very, yeah. You talked about interdisciplinary stuff. Do you guys like to see that? So I'm an animator. Would you guys want to see my animation reel that I might send to an animation company? Or are you looking for, I don't know, what are you guys looking for out of somebody? From Would you hire an animator that is has a portfolio that's more focused on linear animation? Right. If it was great, right? I would say I would definitely want to see it. Yeah, but, okay. but set it up for me. Say, this is my work in linear. This is what I think is strong about it. When I look at working in a game environment, the things I'm excited about doing are this, this, and this. These are the skills that translate. This is the thing I'm teaching myself at the moment. Help me understand that you know the shift that you're making. Sure, it's like it's like see, like notice the gap and then like kind of attack it, right? Uh, and be very deliberate about hey, I'm transitioning into doing this. All right, now I think really the final question was in the back. <laughs> yes, take us home. Well, that's kind of what the whole panel was about. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, how would you go about getting started for designer artists? Were you here at the beginning? No. Okay. So we've yeah. been recorded on video. It's a great. It's a great thing. So if you want to see the first part of our talk, um, that is kind of the what we've been talking about for the last hour, hour, hour and a half now. So, so uh, uh, and uh, gamecenter.nyu.edu. Probably in a few weeks we'll have all, we'll have the full video of this up. So then I definitely recommend that you take a look. Um, let's give our panelists a great round of applause. For all the time. <laughs> and really, thanks you guys. It was it was it was really strong insights. And before we segue into the next set, I wanna I wanna explain what's gonna happen. So first, I wanna call up some people that are here. Cassandra from Take Two, Vincent, Jess, is Marina from High Five Games? Are, is Marina here from High Five Games? Is there anyone else who also wanted to come and, and say, hey, I'm here, I'm hiring, I'm looking for an intern? So Cassandra and Leo, yes. right, you guys are from Take Two Interactive. You yes. may have heard of them. They <laughs> own companies like Rockstar yeah. Games. You guys are the table next door. So what, what did you want to uh, pitch to these guys? Uh, for? So I just want to briefly talk to you about our summer internship program. We are looking, currently looking for interns. Um, and so we can talk specifics at the table, but just a general program. We're looking for interns um, in finance, IT, sales and marketing, and business development. Uh, the fun programming stuff and design, that's not us. But you can find links to K and Monster on our site, and they will list whatever internships they have on their own sites. Um, and then the program itself, we want um, our students to do more than just sit in one internship. That's all you learn. That's all you do. We have seminars all throughout the summer with uh, the different departments within our company. So if you're sitting in finance, you actually get to learn what sales and marketing does, what legal does, what HR does, what corporate development does. 
Leo's jamming out over here. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was my life yeah. soundtrack on it. I'm <laughs> song when I walk into a room, so that was my song. Um, we also, All right. do, we also do fun things. Uh, we did an intern game night the last two years. We set up um, game consoles in our conference room, ordered pizza, played our own games, played board games, hung out, had fun. We went to a Mets game. Uh, we took all the interns and the people that were managing them. So we're sort of trying to get you to learn not just how to do a job, but how to be in a job, how to interact with your managers, with your coworkers. Uh, and then we also have really awesome luncheons with our higher up executives. Our intern program is only about 12 people. That's 12 people sitting with Strauss Selnick, sitting with Carl Slaydoff. Ask whatever questions. Well, sounds like an episode of The Apprentice. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys are, so it's, not, it's an awesome uh, summer internship program, yes. but it's definitely more on the uh, business, marketing, yes. legal, mm -hmm. administrative side of things. So, so uh, Cassandra and Leo, anything else? Uh, that's a come see our table. We have yep. pens and keychains and posters. We have Evolve and Borderlands posters. We don't have enough for everybody, so yeah. fight for them. Uh, <laughs> uh, high five. Okay, so you're not Marina. Steve. Steve from High Five. How's everybody? Hey. Yeah, we're actually, uh, we have a summer internship program starting. Uh, we have about 15 openings, or we should. Uh, you know, we're still trying to figure out what areas, but mostly game development, engineering, QA. Uh, sound, creative, marketing, for the most part, and uh, we're actually moving to the new World Trade Center Tower uh, in April, which is exciting. So that's where the program will be held. And uh, yeah, if you just come talk to us, we'll uh, explain everything. It's a great environment. So, uh, Thanks, Steve. Yeah. I encourage you guys, Steve, also to be be here in this room so people uh, uh, can find you. Uh, Jessica from uh, from Pumpkin what, what, game? what Pumpkin, Pumpkin Games. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hi. All right, so at least one person has already recognized the name. Um, no, I'm, I'm Jess Haskins, I'm creative director of What Pumpkin Studios, um, and we opened a game development studio in New York last year. Uh, we are working on the on Hive Swap, which is an adventure game that was kickstarted a while back um, based on the Homestuck webcomic. Um, we are offering a paid 12 week internship for uh, a game programmer slash game production development generalist. Um, so we're looking for people who, um, preferably with Unity experience, um, who can code in preferably C sharp, um, but you know other like experience with object oriented programming languages and just general good software principles is good. Um, so we are, there's a little bit of gameplay programming, there's some uh, like scene setup in Unity and uh, database entry and kind of random like documentation stuff, depending on whatever else you can do. There are other things like writing website copy or a trailer together. And that's for this summer? You said 12 weeks of summer internship or um, starting now? It's, it's starting now. Um, so we are, we are um, you know, interviewing applicants now, um, starting you know, as, as soon as possible. We're looking for about, um, it's flexible, but we're looking for about like 20 hours a week. But we can work around your school schedule if you have a little more time, if you have a little less. Um, I will be, I don't think I have a table, I'll be kind of- We'll, we'll get we'll get you yeah. set up, we'll get you set up. Uh, I'll be hanging around, come by, say hi, um, and uh, I'll be in more details. Are you- I'm with High Five Games. With High Five Games? Okay, was there anybody else that wanted to? Vincent LaCava, is Vincent in the room? Vincent was in the room. <laughs> uh, Vincent is here, oh Vincent. Did you wanna also, are you looking, Vincent, uh, from uh, This Is Pop? Yes, um, come say hi, we'd love to meet you, we'd love to look at your work. All right, are you, so you're specifically looking for what, for interns or developers or? Freelance talent, so. Freelance <laughs> talent, okay. That's so, uh, 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 all right, so, so this is how it's gonna work. We've set up in this room, so now it's the little, now we shall party, right? Is that the, <laughs> show my needs. Sorry, I watched it from like years ago. But, all right, in this room are, are three different games that kind of show different paths, I think, that some of our graduates have taken. Um, there is Warframe, a sort of a sneak preview at Warframe from Digital Extreme. One of our graduates, um, Shervin, is working there, so that's our AAA path. Sunburn is going to be right here. This is the indie game route. And uh, Stephen Clark, Rooftop Cop, that, that uh, was successfully kickstarted, no, was also an indie game, is also going to be here. So enjoy the games, get some drinks. Thanks for coming, everybody. We're